Good evening, everyone, and welcome. For those who don't mean, know me, my name is Lisa O'Halloran, and I am the district trainer for Rotary International District 6270. I am really excited about tonight's topic and uh, delighted that you've all chosen to join us for what I believe is going to be a really fun, interactive, and exciting session with Tina. A quick housekeeping before we start. My role, I will be monitoring the chat. Feel free to enter questions in the chat, or you can also raise your hand, use the raise hand feature. John will be watching for those. Tina has said she's glad to take questions as we go. I know at some points she will pause and ask those. So please keep that coming. We hope this is more conversation as we go through the session tonight. We are also holding 15 minutes at the end of the session for more conversation and questions. So we're scheduled to go until 7.15. Um, as Don said, it's being recorded and we do upload our videos to the District 6270 YouTube channel. And finally, just a big thank you to Don, our district of the elect, for being our Zoom operator tonight. I'm ready to get started and tell you a little bit about Tina. Tina is the founder and CEO of Change Management Communications Center, LLC, based here in Oshkosh. She's the wife of a world champion senior softball player, the mother of three adult kids, and grandma to a three-year-old toddling um, uh, toddler. Like, you, you put that in there on purpose, so I couldn't get that out. Say that three times fast, right? <laughs> Tina's chuckling at me. But I love this. Tina's also been a bartender, a pre-press film stripper. I actually know what that is. A manufacturing systems manager, a print technology inventor, an IT systems architect, a podcaster, and a tutor and mentor for refugees learning English to start and advance their careers here in the United States, which I think all of that says she's got Rotarian written all over her. So somebody is probably going to recruit her after today. Uh, Tina's known for her leadership development work in C-Streets and on the front lines. She really loves to create structure, processes, communication practices, and behavioral changes. Um, she's here to help us tonight think about how we can evolve, adapt, and expand to enable us to continue to do the good work that we do in Rotary. Personally, I'm really excited about her approach, which is moving thinking from an us-them to a we and how. So without further ado, Tina, welcome to Rotary 6270. Wow, you're making me blush, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we're going to have some fun tonight. And I am going to jump right in with our presentation. But first, I'm turning off my video, not because I don't want to be connected and see you. I just want my bandwidth to be strong so you have a good viewing experience. And like Lisa said, um, I welcome uh, if you unmute and ask a question or participate in conversation, I will be asking you questions um, during the, the presentation as well. So, and I just want a quick confirmation um, that you see the beginning slide, what's changed about leading change? Yeah, we do. You do, okay. And we're gonna talk about you know, what's changed in relationship to culture, context, and competency for change. First, um, you're probably wondering why Lisa might have chosen me to come and talk to you about leading change and how leading change has continued to evolve and what we're doing new um, as change practitioners to support and create structure and context for leaders to grow that alignment to move the changes that they want forward. Um, I'm going to share a brief video. It's under two minutes, but it gives you an idea of how we go about change at Change Management Communication Center based here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, it's different than a lot of the consulting agencies, I would say there are probably less than a handful in the United States and probably a less than 20 globally that have adopted an agile and lean mindset for the discipline, the art and discipline of change management. So I invite you to kind of step into these questions. We're adapting too slowly. And the window of opportunity, it's closing. How do we get this project back on track? Keep 
ground and off schedule. Fix. How do we navigate through this nightmare with mineral loss? We're too close to it. We need a fresh pair of eyes. If you knew how to challenge the way your company tackles change, how do accelerate how you evolve, adapt, and expand? How to attack shifting demands, deadlines, and stay ahead of lead times? Elevating your organization from us and them to we. We're talking about a new way to empower your personnel. Way to accelerate process. A new method of communicating. If you're tired of long winded binders packed with impressive terms and theoretical ideas, who are we? Change management. Never stop conquering. So at change management, that's the culture we strive for. Understanding the change, understanding the environment and the context where the change will occur and understanding each individual and the groups of individuals who will be affected by the change. Our services are broken out in our business in this way. Um, we work primarily in digital transformations, and that has shifted over the last five years of the nine years I've been in business. It now comprises about 58% of the engagements we have with clients. About 10% of the work we do formally is one-on-one -on -one coaching with executives. We are a team of executive coaches as well. We have launched a leadership development program in 2020. We've had um, four cohorts of leaders um, move through that program and um, are, are really growing that sector in our business, that service sector. And then the rest of the business, which is our second largest um, segment of business, is strategic initiatives that aren't digital. So um, that is work that may be mergers and acquisitions or ownership changes. Um, it could be a change in union status. It could be introducing new products to the market. Um, uh, just many, many reasons why leaders want to partner with us to create structure to move their change forward. What we notice about all of the work um, that we're doing is that technology is changing at an exponential pace. And that is part of everybody's day to day. No matter who you are on the planet, technology change is playing a role in your life. Now we've also, well, we haven't yet um, transitioned out of a pandemic. We're maybe in the midst of the pandemic, but the initial shock of the COVID-19 pandemic um, has changed, but we're still working and living in a time of a global pandemic. Um, that has created some challenges in our, in our lives, in our communities, and um, how we accomplish change as well. So we'll talk a little bit about all of this. I share um, these first couple of slides with you so that you have a sense for uh, who I am and how I work and how our team works. So you know why Lisa even invited me to come and talk about change anyway and leading change. So why does change matters so much to Rotary and Rotary International and even more specifically your district. Um, 
because change is important everywhere right now. We are saturated with change. Um, and change happens and occurs within a culture. So let's take a look at the culture lens of change. And I just want anybody to share what is your definition for culture? Because I wanna create a common language around this idea of culture so that we all you know, can understand the term in a similar way as we continue to work through the ideas of leading change and how culture is an aspect of leading change. So what is culture to you? So feel free to unmute and share or pop something into the chat, looking for a few folks to just give us a sense of what that means to you. Yes, courageous folks. Pat might be one of those courageous people. He's, he's always got good ideas. Well, this is Harry, I'll pipe in. I think it's a mutual shared set of core values. That is a con contributor of, of, of culture. Yes, that is a facet of culture. Thank you. This is Angie and um, I would agree. And it's those things that we pass down from generation to de generation and village or social environment. Right, traditions, history, et cetera, that make your culture. Very good. Again. Uh, I, I, I have a question, which is, uh, given the fact that in most organizations and in society today, we have uh, 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 extreme points of view, how, how does change management help and facilitate the process of bringing uh, conversations to the center uh, so that it is more objective and, and, and result-oriented rather than digging our heels into what we believe are uh, the extremes. Oh, I love that question. Thank you. We are going to talk about how we um, sort of rise above all the noise and tension of um, sort of being polarized and divisive, right? And um, really honor and respect different perspectives and get some altitude and create a, a common purpose. That, that is a, an approach and we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. But and for now, second, yeah. I have a second question, which is in the area of digital transformation, one of the things I'm working on is manufacturing digital transformation. Uh, there is a, a need for people to sort of understand the difference between uh, 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 just taking the next step in technology versus thinking about new paradigms of the technology that's being implemented or potentially being there. Uh, so I hope you can address that one too. I hope so too. We've got, um, you know, a, a little more than an hour to talk today and certainly I won't cover everything that we know and that we do with in regard to change management. But um, we will touch on a lot of topics and I welcome further conversations. So at the end of this presentation, I will share my contact information and I welcome any or all of you to get in touch with me and, and we can uh, talk about these ideas further. Um, but for now, let's define culture and, um, and create a common understanding. The, the definition I like to use is that Culture is, in, is the environment in which we live and work. And that includes beliefs, behavior rules, traditions, and rituals that bind us all together. So take, let's take a look at the Rotary International culture, for instance. Um, I've learned that Rotary's motto is service above self. And our vision statement at Rotary is together we see a world where possible, where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Wow, that's super inspiring to me. Um, that's exactly what I like to accomplish too. Um, so yeah, recruit, somebody's gonna recruit me. Karen's been trying for years and I think I just need to do it. Um, your initiatives are all focused around promoting peace, 
fighting disease, providing clean water, sanitation and hygiene, saving mothers and children, supporting education, growing local economies and protecting the environment. So I am curious, what about the Rotary mission, vision and initiatives is working well for District 6270? What's working well for you that's in alignment with, with these guiding principal type of statements? Well, at, at Nina, we have really supported with our STRIVE program education. So the support education part, at least locally, has really been important to us. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Anyone else? I, I think the promoting education is pretty strong throughout the whole district. Uh, I've done a lot of club visits, and uh, almost everybody does something with uh, education. Fantastic. Thank you. This is Angie, and we clearly were formed with and are committed to diversity, which is also a proactive approach to our getting out in the community and working towards positive peace. And then we've been very active in getting more involved in the whole clean water initiative in Milwaukee and are looking at trying to do a global grant around that in the future. But education is also clearly important and feeding the hungry. Perfect. Terrific. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So what could be going better? So think about beliefs, traditions, rituals, um, the way it is in Rotary, and especially in District 6270, what could be going better from a culture perspective to support these guiding principles? Getting many uh, more younger members involved in leadership positions. Good, yeah, thank you. I think doing a better job of orientation and helping people really see how Rotary can help them fulfill their dreams to make a better world and giving them the tools they need and the resources so they can find those interconnects to make Rotary more meaningful and more powerful for them personally and for us. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. What else? What else could be going better? Uh, Tina, I, I think I've got a Rotary t-shirt that says, be the good, believe in the good in the world. And it just seems like we're so surrounded with so much stress in our communities and our world. And I wish Rotary would stand out as a, the, the promote peace and understanding and be the good. Yeah. So are you that, that beacon of peace and good and light? It's a wish. Pat, that, that's a pretty strong statement that you don't see it there yet. And, How and yet we do have to remember that Rotary on two different occasions has been able to broker um, uh, ceasefire agreements oh. to be able to go and immunize children for polio, against polio. So I think we have to see the positive that we have created and then look at all these peace fellows that we've had now over the decades, a little more than a decade, I think, maybe two good decades. So it's there, the tools are there and yeah. things are happening. We just need to help the average Rotarian understand the power of us as a, an organization, not just see it as a weekly meeting. Yeah, you gave me uh, goosebumps mm -hmm. with that statement. To, to Angie's point, thinking about our, how we tell our story, right? There's lots of that good that's happening and who, know, who knows it? Right? How is that shared? And back to Nancy's comment about getting more younger members, being willing to question the way we do things and ask ourselves if they're conducive to the lifestyle and schedule of people who are mm. lower in age than what our, our average member is. Right? Are we accessible? Yeah. Yes. I'd like to offer a comment about we've talked about being the beacon and telling our story. I think I would like to see more, uh, more of the actual telling of that story. I'd like to see, I mean, the, the mechanics of it is public relations, but I'd, I'd like to see um, us get the word out to our own communities and, and around the, 
this this part of the state of the stuff that we're up to, uh, both as as individual clubs, as a district, and as Rotary in general. And good point, and Tina, our our incoming. Um, Rotary International President, which has started July 1st, and as a woman, um, wonderful, is yeah. to be a storyteller. Great. Ooh, that is okay. So, Lisa, help me remember, um, I have a storytelling canvas that I will share with this group after this meeting um, as, a, as kind of a, a virtual goodie bag, because it is a powerful tool, but I don't know that we'll have time to really dive into it tonight. But I think that that could help with your PR initiative and um, really uh, encourage you to inquire deeper into the audience and what they need to hear from you and how they need to hear it um, so that your story shines for them. Perfect, duly noted. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so how would you describe the culture of Rotary? So if you describe what it's like, I've been to one Rotary meeting um, and presented mm, the West Side Rotary meeting in Oshkosh, probably about eh, six or seven years ago. So I have an idea of how I would describe the Rotary, but I'm not gonna share that first. I want you to share with me how you describe the Rotary. I think you should share. <laughs> I, know, I believe you, right? But, but I think it's healthy for me to hear and for you to hear your, um, your experience and relationship to the culture, like how you describe it before you hear like from a one-timer lunch meeting, uh, you know, attendee presenter. Tina, Pat shared in the chat, old white guys writing checks. There we go. <laughs> he did if say- I, if, I can, if I can jump in, I'm a, I'm a newer member. Yeah. And as an example, you know, with the different generations and I've been in manufacturing uh, since the age of three and, you know, basically executive management most of my career, you know, when I when I walked into um, Rotary in Sheboygan, I I, I want to basically uh, chant the same thing that was just said: old white guys writing checks. And when I looked for people that were my age or younger and or um, not high school students attending, I. I, I really struggled in finding that. And I think part of the problem that, we, that we're kind of trying to tiptoe around is what, what does the younger group really look for and what is going to attract them? And if, and Tina, I'm sure you, you, you've been to many different groups and different organizations. They, there's, a, there's a huge outcry that younger generations want to feel that they're making a difference. But I hate to say it, it's kind of like the supper club situation. Why are supper clubs going away? Because supper clubs were what the older generation enjoyed. It was their, their meeting place. Rotary seems almost like the same kind of thing. It's a, it's a once a week supper club. And I, I'm just giving some opinions here, but if we really want to change things, we really need to ramp up and amp up what is what is Rotary trying to accomplish? Um, what are we trying to do for the greater good? Because we're not going to get from what I understand. And Tina, please jump in if I'm saying something. But I'm I'm one of those people that's honest and straightforward. So yeah, you can read, so. you can read me like a comic book. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is, we're I think we're we're missing the part where. We're trying to get more members, but I, I don't think we're going to get more members that are going to be there every day. They're going to be there for different events, depending on how it how they feel to that event's well-being to the community or to the environment or to whatever the greater good is of that event. I don't think it's going to be a club like it was for generations because that's not what the younger generation wants. They're not buying in to showing up every Saturday 
Um, I'm also a board member for Habitat. Getting the younger generation to come and volunteer is very difficult. I might be able to get a few people for a house raising, but they'll show up once and they're done. So I, I'll be quiet. Thank, thank you, Todd. Yeah, those are great contributions. And I promised I'd share my re reflection, right? Um, so the my experience, I was impressed and delighted to see rituals, um, the flow of the meeting, right? The traditions um, and the close relationships. So I witnessed a group of people who knew each other well, enjoyed each other's company, and were committed to getting stuff done together. What was difficult for me was I didn't feel part of it, even though I had friends in the room. I still is sort of an outsider, which is okay. That's cool. I hadn't been part of the club, and I'm still not yet. Um, and I was overwhelmed by the time commitment that it was a story in my head. It might not be right, but I thought, oh my gosh, if I have to come to a meeting every week like this and spend time planning and accomplishing things in the community, which is the higher cause um, that I wanted to serve, um, I don't know how I do everything else that I need to do in my life. So for those reasons, it just seemed like a lot to commit to and I wasn't sure I could deliver on promises. Um, with my work schedule, with travel, with kids, my kids were teenagers at the time, um, you know, all of those things. So that was just my one time experience. But these are good thoughts. Um, we're not going to solve these issues tonight. We're going to talk about how to approach them and how to approach them as leaders with new science, right? New ways of leading change. Um, so does Rotary have the culture that can navigate innovation, conflict, ambiguity, and all of this pressure? And does your district, dis District 6270, have the culture that it takes to navigate innovation, conflict, ambiguity, and pressure? Maybe not everything you need, huh? So I, I, the thing that sort of comes to my mind is Rotary clubs are so uh, decentralized in the sense that they are culturally very uh, uh, um, focused on the communities that they have uh, formed out of. And hence the, the culture in each club will be different uh, but there i think what is missing or, or or i feel that is is kind of still forming is the central thread around why these clubs need to come together towards a common good it used to be polio uh and mm -hmm. and, and 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 hence that sort of brought a certain uh, sort of momentum and a uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, center of gravity, if you may, uh, towards a certain uh, cause. And I think looking at it from the generation that we are look uh, we are in, it comes down to how can we entice uh, people who are different in many ways to have a common goal. And I think that w that's what Rotary stands for. And, I, and, 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 and my father was a, a Rotarian in India, and I am a Rotarian here. And, but the Rotary culture is something that is universal. And I think we may, may have sort of diluted that in, in the sense that we become so sort of community oriented in each, each uh, uh, club because so focused on what they're doing that it becomes uh, a sort of uh, 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 a mosaic, if you may, rather than a, a central thread. Yeah, what a great observation. Um, thank you for that. A, a unifying cause is critical for um, a large global organization 
um, to have alignment. Um, and, and I totally understand the value of all of the subcultures of local um, rotary clubs. So it doesn't need to be an either or. I think the answer here is somewhere with the and also um, type of scenario. Thank you for, for raising that, that question and that noticing that. Today, we need to really look strong at some behavior change and some mindset change that goes along with leadership. Because leadership styles and strategies need to evolve in relationship to the information that's available and that exponential pace of change. So this is a picture of a chart that we, at Change Management, we draw this and put it up on the wall frequently. So this is taken right out of one of our workshop sessions. And what we are looking at in this graph is uh, the vertical line is volume, volume of information that's available. And then the horizontal line is time. So if you look at the red curve, that is the amount and availability of data and information. And the blue line that's kind of flat across kind of like a horizon that represents human potential. And what we see here is that over time, people have access to more and more information readily at their fingertips um, than they ever have before. And the amount of information that is coming to us and that is available is more than what human potential can currently handle. Probably up until the late 1980s, change could be led quite easily with a strategy and oftentimes an authoritarian strategy or hierarchical strategy. There was a vision, you know, some guiding principles, and it was sort of a, um, a top-down type of approach to lead change. That doesn't work so well anymore. One, I know that I was raised and I raised my kids to, to you know, show up as leaders. So they don't fit well and work well in an authoritarian environment. And I have a belief, right? So beliefs have changed and shifted since, since before. And at some point they changed and that's the dotted line. And I don't know what year that is or what decade that is, but I, I suspect it was sometime between the, you know, the 90s and uh, the 2010s. Um, all of a sudden people realized that working together to lead change is a better option because none of us can see it all and none of us can know it all. And, and teams worked before, right? But there was generally that, that leader at the top that was visualizing, implementing and directing change. So things have changed. And if you see the human potential line, we really, really, really need to collaborate to innovate and lead change now. So in our organization, we've adopted the Agile Manifesto. And there are four principles to the Agile Manifesto. And if you've worked in the world of IT or even in manufacturing, Agile, Lean, um, these are the guiding principles for that mindset. And to me, like, um, Kanban and scrums are, are different ways of accomplishing or working with um, Agile. Um, I would say that's the lowercase a Agile, being Agile. Um, the mindset Agile, the capital A Agile um, is the mindset. And I believe the mindset is more important than the how. The who you be as a leader with these guiding principles is more important than the tactics that you use to get it done. 
So this manifesto values individuals and interactions over process and tools. Successful change over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration, and that might need to say stakeholder collaboration over contract negotiation. Responding to change over following a plan. Now you can see over is, is you know, bold and orange here. And what I wanna tell you is that the items on the right side of the word over, they're important, they have value. This just means that the items to the left of that bold word over are more important. Does that make sense? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. You can use your um, emoji emoticons, you know, clap, cheer, um, you know, take another sip of that margarita, Karen, if this resonates. <laughs> and, and whenever we lead change, all change, 100% of change, 100% of the chat time always occurs within the context of a relationship. And not all relationships are the same. Organizations and communities are created with direct and interact connections among groups of people. But change still affects individuals and groups one at a time and differently in accordance with their interest and role in the relationship to the change itself. So um, we like to create stakeholder maps to really understand who's going to be affected, how do we reach them, who holds the relationships, where do we need to build some bridges, and what's the best way to reach all of these people. We also assess, you know, is it going to be a high impact or medium impact or low impact to these individuals or groups? Who's going to be a ready mover? Who's, who's going to go along? And who might, you know, respond differently and say, no, nope, I'm not going for that. Um, we assess that uh, with leaders and teams and change champions so they know how to navigate in leading change. And they can, they can create ways of reaching others um, that, that resonate. And this is something that one of you were talking about, um, the person who whose dad was in Rotary in India and you're in Rotary here in the US, um, leveraging intrinsic motivations. Rotary has incredible opportunity to leverage intrinsic motivations. It's why all of you are Rotarians. It's why Rotary appeals to me. Um, it's, it's internal, service above self. You're doing it because you want to, you're, doing because, you're not doing it because you get something for it. And here's the deal. Studies show that when we begin to value the rewards we get personally for doing the task, we lose our inherent interest in doing it. We literally lose interest. You'll, you'll lose steam. So if the payoff um, is because you want to do it, You've got that want to, that desire to change the world in the way that Rotary wants to change the world. You're going to be motivated and you're going to motivate others if they share that intrinsic value. So to modernize leadership, I've got three steps, three giant steps. They seem simple, but they're giant. One, adopt an agile mindset. I really believe that that's going to get you far. Two, create structure and context to lead change. Um, don't just lead change as you go or by a checklist. Um, it, it's iterative, it's experimentation, it's getting feedback and understanding how people respond to change. So measure and monitor the results, both in feedback and variance to your goal. How are you tracking? And what are you going to do about that? So the evolution of change management looks something like this. Pre-1990, 
tons of research. Early 1990s, all of a sudden, some companies like LaMarche and ProSci show up and they begin to teach actionable practice. So it went from academic study to actionable practice and there was more structure around it. In the late 1990s, it became a distinct leadership discipline and, and training agencies, certifications. In the 2000s, it became a really heavy process and it was driven mechanically. Like it was a to-do list on top of a to-do list, integrating with project management to-do list. It was bulky. In 2010, in, the, in, the, in those decades, practitioners started to shed a lot of those heavy processes and they adopted a lean and agile approach because they had no choice. The pace of change accelerated. So today, um, that's where we are. We're ready to integrate with other disciplines. We do it with ease and we are building robust mindsets, skill sets, and tool sets so that people can advance changes at that exponential pace in a saturated change environment. So the old way looked kind of like a leader leading change with the rest of their job and everything was urgent. The new way looks something like this. And, and if you look at this change cycle, the new way change cycle, um, we're gonna focus on this for a few minutes because it's a, it's a really cool way to look at change and the change cycle. The cycle goes around the outside of that ball of resistance in the middle. And the cycle moves in a clockwise direction, okay? Around the outside moving in the clock direct, clockwise direction are all the phases in a cycle of change, a complete cycle of change. And it's sort of um, repetitive. Uh, so who wants to guess where the cycle of change begins? Which phase is the beginning of a change cycle? In the dark. In the dark? Yeah. That is the most popular guess. It I think is, time however, to, incorrect. <laughs> I'm time to move on. I and something's not right, and I got to move on. That's that's closer. That's not it. <laughs> that the cycle of change begins with awareness that leads to desire for more knowledge that leads to change. Yeah. So the awareness. So I don't see that. I'm not sure. Yeah. So so the awareness is awareness of a result a result that no longer serves you, a result that you don't want anymore. You want a different result. At that point, you notice and recognize it's time to move on, but you're not sure what to do. That's in the dark. Then you see the challenge. You, you figure out what you need to do and you're ready to get started and then roll out the changes. This is a very good way to look at a change cycle. Um, even five years ago, I told leaders, know where you are in the change cycle with your vision, because typically leaders or people leading change somehow knew about results they didn't like or weren't useful anymore and um, knew it was time to move on. They, they solved the problem. You know, they were in the dark, they solved the problem and they're ready to get started. And that's when they start sharing their ideas with other people. Uh, in their organization. And when they introduced change, they wouldn't start with the results. They'd start with get started. And they would share what people were going to do, how, when, and why. Um, now, in the new, new way of leading, I encourage leaders to introduce results Ask others if they also believe it's time to move on and go into the dark together, even if you've worked beyond that as a leader, as a visionary, as an innovator. Because people need to settle into the idea of change 
and that the results aren't what they need anymore. And once you invite them into the dark with you, like, but I'm not sure exactly how we're going to solve this problem and I'd like your help, guess what's going to happen? That change sounds more like an invitation than a shove. And the change you're leading is going to become a higher priority for them because they will have intrinsic motivation. You ask for help. Does that make sense? It does. Tina, curious question. It, it, where in the process do we assess willingness to change? Every, every step of the process as a change ma manager, a change practitioner. And I will show you how that can be very iterative. Um, this, this approach flies in the face of Tom Cotter's very popular um, eight-step model for change. It begins with create urgency. Um, two, put a team together. Three, develop vision and strategies. Four, communicate the change vision. Five, remove obstacles. Six, short-term goals. Seven, keep the momentum. Eight, make it stick. Um, that's what the person on the left is up to <laughs> in this. I'm going to share a little more old way, new way for this to come together. Old way, new way, old way, good change leaders provide directions. New way, great change leaders provide direction. Now, the difference between direction and directions is subtle but profound. This subtle difference separates good change leaders from great change leaders. If you think about it, direction is the far off destination that you're heading for. Directions are how you will get there. Direction is a shared vision for an aspirational future state that everyone is working together to achieve. Directions are the details, rules, procedures for how you will execute the journey. Good change leaders closely manage the execution of the journey. But great change leaders set context, provide direction, and then enable and empower people to find their own path. Nobody really wants or needs to be told how to go there anymore. They'll co-create that way with you. There may be an approval process but involve them in the creation process, how to create that journey. Uh, measuring progress and change, you ask that question, how often or where do we measure um, resistance or acceptance? Um, it used to be stakeholder engagement or was done, you know, the length of the plan, then the documentation was delivered, Communication was broadcast, activities are completed. There's a business readiness survey. We'd understand, you know, some feedback then about resistance. And then, you know, it's implemented and the milestones are met. Right now, we engage stakeholders throughout the entire life cycle of the change. From the moment we get results we don't like through rolling it up. Before we viewed change as one big block, now we view change in bursts of activity, cycles of activities. We used to approach change in a waterfall um, methodology, and that would create a long amount of time of trying to create a perfect plan. With agile change, we're constantly putting that vision ahead of us um, creating some activity to live into, to move into that future state and assessing the work, the feedback that we get at each step of the way. Change occurs within change. So we need to be responsive to that too. We don't wanna do something that doesn't make sense just for doing sake, it was part of the plan. So think of that agile mindset. Um, we like to do things with sticky notes on a big wall if we're in person, but we realize we're in hybrid work environments and we're working with global teams. So oftentimes we do things with sticky notes on 
um, white birding applications. The best one I know of, the one I believe everybody, every leader needs to, to know how to use, and it's pretty simple, it's called Miro, M-I-R-O. Um, so, so take a look, you can take a five minute class in Miro, it's free. Using Miro itself is free. Um, you can buy a business license like I have to keep some boards private um, and share with more people. But uh, if you want to learn how to use Miro, I highly encourage it. This is how we lead and help leaders lead change, really complex change, and also pretty simple change um, and know what's going on with their stakeholders and how we're progressing with our activities. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a little video of what Miro activity looks like when everybody's collaborating. It's really highly interactive. And let's see, I need to stop that. There we go. And I can advance to the next slide. I'd like to hear what feedback you have for me. We have, I can share um, outside of the deck some, some Miro boards that we put together um, and use internally to gather information. I invite you as leaders to a follow-up session. I'm gonna be meeting with Lisa and Don and Mike um, to talk about some next steps with Rotary and change and really identifying the changes that you think need to occur and then testing them out, testing the ideas out on, on a canvas, a strategy canvas and um, then prioritizing the work that you might do as a district or as clubs. But I'm open for your questions and feedback. It's, it's interesting, Tina, because a lot of our clubs are so rooted in history and traditions and it's difficult for them to change. Yeah. And the senior members of clubs. Um, so it's kind of, their resistance that can sometimes make it difficult for clubs to continue to grow and to accept new members, all types of different new members. So it's kind of what we're dealing with too. Yeah, there's a little bit of inertia that comes with a lot of tradition. Mm -hmm. Rob has a question. Um, it's an observation. Uh, as Rotarians, you know, we're international. We have opportunities to serve in, in limitless numbers of countries. We have uh, community uh, service that we do, some in, in large communities, some in small communities. We've got seven avenues of service uh, to attract uh, new members to. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, we've talked about this for a number of years, you know, attracting the younger people and everything. And I was struck by what Todd said about his experience with Habitat for Humanity which is about as narrow a focus as I think you could get in an organization. And he attracts people and they find out they don't like it. How, I mean, <laughs> if you go to Habitat for Humanity thinking you're gonna get something other than building houses, there's something wrong with, with you know, your, your thought process. Are we running into that with the people that don't really know what they want and they have short attention span? Mm, yeah, our, our attention spans, human attention span has shrunk to be less than that of a goldfish. Microsoft did a study and a goldfish has about 14 seconds of attention before it will shift its eyes and, you know, motion towards something else. Mm -hmm. Humans have about 12 these days. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, that we're overwhelmed telling. with information. Yeah, it is that overwhelm of information. So, um, I invite you to consider doing something that uh, Mercedes-Benz did. Um, they got to know their target audience really well. They invited them all to you know, a conference and paid their way and um, asked them lots of questions about they want, what they wanted and needed in relationship to transportation. And um, at the end of that, they changed their whole corporate strategy to meet the needs of future automotive consumers. Um, 
so there may be a way of getting to know the next generations, generations that aren't um, the primary participants in Rotary now, a little differently and a little better. And it, it requires you to be the listener with a generous amount of authentic curiosity rather than feeding them information. But then how do they how do they find out what they're looking for? Because they're not asking the question. If they're if they're telling us what they want, you know, we're adapting to what they are, but they're not finding out anything about rotary. If, mm. if we don't give them information. Well, I think you can create some context for them, but then ask, you know, um, what would service above self mean to them? What goals would they like to accomplish in relationship to, to peace? What does that look like for them? Really open up the ideas and form your questions in a way that align with Rotary values, but really be open to their responses about what it means for them and how they, what participation might look like for them, what would be inspiring for them. I have kids and friends um, in every generation that's alive today. And I know young people want to leave an indelible mark for good in this world. So even though it's hard to reach them, don't give up on them. That's not any different than our generation. We wanted to changed the world in the 60s and the yeah. 70s and uh, you know that hasn't changed very much right right so the intrinsic motivation exists we're good humans we're good humans every generation is full of good humans let me uh let me offer something up along the lines of what you've just been talking about um short of um creating some sort of a ginormous offsite and involving all, or inviting a whole bunch of folks uh, who are, you know, the, the target audience and so on. I think the answer, um, at least tactically within each club, is to get your young folks on your board and listen to them. Give them a chance to um, make suggestions, to institute programs, to get uh, new activities going, things like that. I think that's um, that's an easy step, and it's probably one that most clubs are making. Um, the challenge comes in, though, in in overcoming the momentum of some of the older folks who've been in Rotary for a long time and like it the way it is. Thank you very much. Um, and that's the hard, to me, anyways. That's the hard part of uh, making change happen. And that is motivating the folks who don't want to be motivated to support that change. That, that's the hard part. Well, I, I, I see both things here when uh, Rob talked about habitat. Habitat is so much more than building homes. And it varies by affiliate. Um, Oshkosh is a very different affiliate than our Greater Fox Cities one. but. As a photographer, when I visit a site for Habitat, I make a point of talking to the people about our other, pro we have seven prongs of our Greater Fox Cities Habitat, and it's so much more than building a home. But if you don't tell people, and that's so I, the storytelling part that our woman international president is bringing in, but then listening, I mean, it, when story, storytelling has to be a give and take, right? You gotta listen as we're talking about the young people, but the young people, that we have in our clubs, young people that we impact when we go pick up the trash on a highway and this sort of thing, they, they don't know, they don't know the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah. So, and you're right, Pete, it doesn't need to be a big conference like what Mercedes Benz does, absolutely lean it down and agile it, right? Like do what works in and experiment with it. You know, maybe one idea is inviting those younger members to the board um, and then Another idea might be reaching people who, you know, are potential members, what, understanding what the barriers to membership are. Nobody ever asked me, why aren't you joining? 
<laughs> Karen, I think you did. Yeah. I was like, time, time. Yeah. One of the uh, the, the opportunities that uh, I see Angie has uh, left the meeting, but uh, the Amigos Rotary does uh, a lot of uh, um, community service stuff with other organized groups rather than uh, work up something themselves. And one of their projects that they do two or three times a year is uh, clean up the uh, Milwaukee River um, area, the, uh, the three or four rivers and stuff. And, and it's a wonderful opportunity to meet other people that are sharing a, uh, a common desire. We want to clean up the environment yeah. and tell them, you know, what Rotary is doing. Um, and I know they do that in, uh, in the uh, times that they go out and work. They, because I, I helped them last uh, April and, uh, and several of the people that I met were, oh yeah, you're with Rotary. You do this all the time, don't you? You know, so people are familiar with it, but uh, um, whether we're, we're closing the deal or not, I don't know. I think that's great. And it, yeah, like silent sport clubs or, you know, people who are in also part of environmental movements, right? There's, there's lots of ways to connect. It's those relationships, right? To create that relationship map. Our granddaughter stopped by to visit, so I can't let her leave without a kiss from Mimi. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're not Hi, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> I think this is a perfect time to ask Don if he could share the many questions we have. Uh, a big part of learning is reflection. Like, what did I take in from today? And what might this mean for me after the session tonight? So we have a couple of questions um, for you to share input on using menti.com. If you've been on a session before, you know the tool. Um, you can grab a device, you can get a tablet, your phone, uh, and go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. Um, or if you don't have a secondary device, you can open a new window on your computer. You just won't see what we're doing at the same time. But this is the audience participation part. Um, we have two questions about feedback, and then we're going to ask you to tell us what you thought of the session. And we can continue to ask questions um, as we move toward our 715 close. So the first one is thinking about the session, what did you find most valuable tonight? Was there an aha? Something like, I never thought of it that way. Or that was, I found that particularly interesting, right? So kind of reflect on the conversation that Tina has led us through and go ahead and type in your answer. Once you go to menti.com, the code is on the screen. The code is 6545-3835. It's on the top of the screen, 6545-3835. And if you are in another browser, I can just go ahead and put it in the chat too. So you can copy and paste it. 65453835. Oh, got you, Rob. I really did like the supper club simile as well. Right, agile manifesto, a reminder, good stuff. Yeah, that subtle difference between that S when you pluralize direction to directions and what that means, the importance of relationships. And I love that, Re realizing that change starts when the current results aren't working, right? When we're not happy with the present state, that's when we have that initiative, that oomph to do something different. But Rob says he's gonna look at Miro. That oh, is his, yeah. so I love that. Another agile comment. What other takeaways are valuable? I'm gonna ask about what you're gonna do next. Give everyone just another moment. And you can actually put in multiple things. It'll let you answer more than once. So if you think of something else, feel free to type another submission. Yes, engaging stakeholders through the entire process. Very different. Great discussion of the evolution of change management and the authoritarian approach that it was. Yes, the transition from hierarchy, right? We're all in this together. We're in the dark. And as leaders, we don't have to have the answer. We just have to have the desire to change and to move forward and to value others' input that's going to help us get there. Tina, feel free to jump in on any of these that you're seeing. This is great. I, I really appreciate this feedback. You guys are 
a great group of, of leaders already. So some of these changes um, and what was, was important helps me, you know, get better at presenting some of this information. Uh, the four um things important <laughs> than traditional documentation. Yeah, yeah, I, you bet I thought that was you. And I will share this slide deck with this group after too. So you, you'll get the recording, but you'll, you can also get the deck so that you can look at some of the slides, digest them, play with the ideas a little bit. Um, I'm glad that you found value. Thank you. That's Tina, thank you for generously generously offering to share your materials. I think we're ready for the next question, Don. And Rob just had an aha uh -huh in the chat, and I hope it's okay. I'm going to share yes. it. He did direct message it to me. I realize our club is made up of motivated people who joined in their 30s, 35 years ago. Oh. Ah. Yeah. And Tina wants to see a puppy. Somebody <laughs> must have had a puppy. So. This is the, the actionable slide, right? What do you think you might do differently or do next based on what you learned today? What's kind of rolling around in your head? What might what might a next action be? Everyone's really pondering this one. Rob already shared. He's checking out Miro, the whiteboarding tool. Oh, good. And he's going to find a young person and talk to them about Rotary. Great. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to, I invite you to consider this differently instead of, um, yeah. Okay. You got it. I will ask my Rotary group what youth wants to be a part of. When you meet with that younger person, um, really ask the questions like, "What what would peace or or you know creating more peace in the world look like for you? What do you want to do about that? You know, just get curious. Ask questions. Frame it that way so that you can hear them, hear what they want to do. You know, but constrain it to the the mission of Rotary and the initiatives of Rotary. Once they say that, I asked Tina to share a person. Thank you. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Asking, I love the curiosity that's showing up in these answers. That's exactly what we need. Curiosity is the most powerful leadership skill. And then listening. Yeah. Right. And yes. even if you hate their answer, thank them for it, right? Like value it. You want to keep them engaged and talking and considering being the change. Nice. And I may have messed up creating this slide and that people can only do one uh, answer. Sure. So if you have something af after you submit, drop it in the chat or feel free to unmute and share. Hi, this is great. Listen to learn, be curious, right? Be inquisitive. Yes. Why? What's people's why? I think we're ready for the last slide done. On a scale of one to five, one being meh, five being totally awesome. How would you rate tonight's session? One, two, three, four, five, scale of one to five. One's the lowest, five's the highest. This is just the, the quick. Wow. I don't know if only Pat voted or. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like only one of my rating fans. Good, good. Thank you. <laughs> this is great feedback. I really appreciate your participation too. That that helps tremendously. As the votes keep coming in, 
Um, I'm going to ask if Tina would like to share any contact information in the chat with the group. Um, again, I will be sending out a follow-up email, so I'll send you the link and the slide deck and, and some of the other goodies that she promised. Um, but if you'd like to reach out to her directly, I know that she does welcome those conversations as well. So Tina, feel free if you want to drop info or yeah. connect with her on LinkedIn, what have you. Yeah. Well, I, I and while people are voting, and I noticed that Tina says she uh, share share the storytelling canvas. Um, I will also say, wear your rotary shirt or wear rotary wear a lot. That is an invitation to a conversation. It's an invitation to a story. So figure out what your stories are and then make sure you go out there wearing your rotary gear. Great tip, absolutely. It begs the question, right? Fantastic. Are there other questions for Tina before we close the session this evening? Thank you, Natraj. Good to have you here. Thank you. Looking around the room. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight as we listen and learn and ponder how we continue to evolve and adapt to grow Rotary. Big thank you to Tina for giving of her time and talent tonight. We appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more, thank you. Yes, God. Yeah, let's do some of that. <laughs> um, if you are interested in being part of a kind of a debrief next steps uh, group that will be getting together after this session, feel free. I'm, I'm going to put Don on the spot and say e email Don or, or me and um, we will loop you in uh, when, the, um, when that happens. Um, but I think that's everything we have for tonight. Any parting words, Tina? Thank you all. I really appreciate you, um, your time. I want to invite you um if you're interested in the topic and you you want more right like a more hands-on experience um on september i think it's september 15th amplify oshkosh um and you can find amplify oshkosh amplify oshkosh.com um it's a tech movement in oshkosh and we bring tech-minded people together uh, and we share ideas once a month uh, and it's an ideas amplified event and Amy Peach and I will be presenting and sharing some tools that you will be able to use hands on to um, prioritize change. So we'll be using um, kind of an old tool, the, the McKinsey 7S tool with a modern twist and Todd, I know I shared that tool with you. I don't know if you've looked at it. But it will be fun. You'll be working with other leaders in the Oshkosh community and regional community. Um, so it would be great networking and maybe even recruiting events. So September 15th, amplifyoshkosh.com. I don't think the event is up yet, but it should be in the next day or two. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Tina, for that tip. And Don did drop the URL into the chat. He beat me to it. Awesome. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. Yeah, good night. Take care.